Hi everybody, I'm Marty Stewart. I am at Amoeba right here in Hollywood, and this is what's in my bag. I ran into my whole, a big piece of my musical life here. This was the first record I ever owned. Right here. This record uh, actually came in a different cover at the time, but this is, was the second record I ever owned. And the crazy part about it was the only two jobs I ever had in my life was with Lester Flett and Johnny Cash. And uh, I used to watch their television shows, and I would think someday, well, I wish I could be one of their kids and, you know, take that banjo case or take that guitar case to the bus for them. I was crazy that way. I started to work with Lester Flett when I was 13. I left home, I was cutting yards one day, and the next day I was in his band. It was like joining the Navy. It never hit me. Until about 20 years later, one of my, my drummer brought his kid out on the bus, Travis. The pimples and voice changing. I said, Travis, oh, he's at 13. <laughs> and I saw myself sitting there, and it almost made me sick. I thought, man, that, could, that was you, and you didn't know, have any sense to know any better, you know. God took care of me. When they hear the dinner bell from the Shady Rest Hotel at the Jumble. And when Lester passed away, I didn't have anywhere to work. All the bluegrass bands were full. Bill Monroe's band was full. Ralph Stanley didn't need anybody. Jimmy Martin, the Osborne Brothers, none of those guys needed a musician. But I went into a guitar store one day uh, where I had my guitar fixed and a buddy of mine named Danny Farrington was building this really fancy black guitar. So who's that for? He said, Johnny Cash. I said, I want to go with you when to deliver it. When the door swung open, John, I called him JR, was sitting playing a guitar and Cowboy Jack Clement was dancing with a martini on his head and John was singing the Wabash Gown Ball. John stood up to shake my hand. He just kept shaking my hand. He said, where are you from? I said, Mississippi. He said, I thought so. He said, where have you been? I said, getting ready. Three or four weeks later, they called and I was, you know, working in the band. Run softly, Blue River. Run cool and deep, oh, I thrill to her kisses. But the one that really mattered, where'd she go? This girl, Connie Smith. My mom had a record of Connie's called Miss Smith Goes to Nashville. I would just go by and look at her because I thought she was the prettiest girl in the world. And one day I was in uh, the living room and we were the stereo, the radio was playing it. Coming to the 1970 Choctaw Indian Fair, Miss Connie Smith from the Grand Ole Opry in Nashville. I went, Mama, she's coming. So mom took my, my sister Jennifer and me out to the Choctaw Fair to see Connie Smith sing. I asked my mom if I could borrow her camera. And so I went back to where Connie was sitting in her car. And I said, Miss Smith, can I take your picture? Yeah. And I went, Pew! And it was the first picture I ever took in my life. And I thought about it, and I was really serious about it. I was 12 years old. And on the way home that night, I said, someday I'm going to marry Connie Smith. And she's sitting right over there. <laughs> However strange it may seem to your heart, when the right record or the right person comes through, you know, be brave enough to let it in because you never know. I don't care who was wrong or who was right, I'll come running to you. I found this record. I was spellbound when I heard down, 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 and heard those prisoners start screaming. I was in front of my Aunt Waldine's stereo, and I stood there and listened, and this must, must have been this big of my arm. And it was like something was reaching inside of my heart and doing this. And if I had to point to one record, if you've never heard rock and roll in your life, and if you've never heard country music in your life, go get this record. And this was not the most, you know, glamorous time in his life. He was coming up out of the ashes, and he was using this jailhouse as his theater. So they recorded the, the set one time, took a break, and re-recorded -re it one more time in the morning. So it was done by noon as far as just a man, his guitar, his band, and his songs coming up out of the ashes. If you want the definition of American country music, American rock and roll, whatever Americana music is, here it is. If I had to take one record to heaven with me, it would be that one right there. Took a shot of cocaine and away a run. Made a good run, but I run too slow. They overtook me down in war as Mexico. The other thing I chose, I ran straight into myself. This was the first record I ever played on when I played, went to work with Lester Flatt in Nashville. And this record means a lot to me because this is kind of the situation. Lester was kind of just a, a legendary Grand Ole Opry kind of act. He and Earl Scruggs did the Beverly Hillbillies thing. 
And you know, Foggy Mountain Breakdown was a part of the Bonnie and Clyde film that Warren Beatty and Faye Dunaway did. But then we worked a show. There's a song on this record called Feud and Banjos, which is Duel and Banjos, which is the song that was featured in Deliverance. Now let's you just drop them pants. Drop? Just take them right off. And it was just a part of the set for a lot of years, just a lot of years. And so when the Deliverance film came out, that, this, this song had just been a part of this old show for a long time. So we played this concert in, in Cincinnati, Ohio, and it was called a College Buyer Showcase. The acts were Lester Flat, Chickaria, and Coolin' again. <laughs> and here we are in these cowboy hats and these Kentucky kind of gentleman clothes, and I remember walking on the bus going, they're gonna laugh us off the stage. But we didn't know about the secret weapon of feuding banjos. Because that movie was so popular and the song was so big, we just did it. And it was all hippies and kids, you know, in the, in the crowd. It exploded. The place exploded. We encored it. And that was the first of nine encores in a 45 minute set. The next day, Lester's agent took 72 bookings in college campuses and rock festivals across America. So we were rock stars the next day. I went really heavy on the birds. When I first went to work with um, Lester, Roland White was the mandolin player. And his brother was this man right here, Clarence White, a great guitar player. They were, they were based here in Hollywood for so many years. And uh, he was tragically killed in 1973. But that's Clarence's guitar, and that guitar is probably more famous than all of us put together. But that's the guitar I bought in 1980 and still play. But I went heavy on the birds, and one, one thing that was really, that struck me about this one, this is called Bird Maniacs. There was a song on the new record called Whole Lotta Highway. And I woke up that morning thinking, I have to go to the studio today and I want to work on my guitar solo, make it a little better. Michelle, Clarence's daughter, brought Clarence's mask to the studio that day to show to me. And while I was playing the solo, Clarence's mask was down here looking up at me and I'm going, whoa. <laughs> it couldn't get any better. It was spooky and it was, it was, it was a spirit-filled moment, but it was big. When I hear the birds come out of my speakers to this day, I become a little kid again. The Rogers, Rickenbacker, that jangle. It just, I can close my eyes and see palm trees and the Hollywood sign and the blue skies out here. It just transported me. Their, their music had the power to transport me from my bedroom in Mississippi to California way before I ever got here. Today is a reminder to me, more than looking for new things, it's a reminder to me that when you make records, they're forever. They will be here long after we're gone and hopefully they inspire somebody. And this is a pile, I'm sitting in the middle of a pile that absolutely touched my heart and it changed my life. Glory, glory, Thank you guys.